Hello everyone um, and welcome to the Floating Offshore Wind mini-series part two. Um, in this panel we're going to discuss uh, what potentially are the best technologies for floating offshore wind in Taiwan. Um, we're also going to take a look at some of the steps that perhaps industry needs to take to really deliver floating and, and what a supportive policy environment might look like. Um, I'm Richard Birch and I'm the offshore wind lead um, for the UK's Department of International Trade. Um, and I will pass over now to my colleagues to introduce themselves. Um, Glenn, would you like to yep. start? Thanks, Richard. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Glenn She. Uh, I'm the Business Development Director for Taiya Renewable Energy. Taiya Renewable Energy is a uh, local offshore wind developer, which we are uh, contributed in the auction in um, uh, round three this year. I'm really happy to be here today. Thanks. Hello, my name is James James. I'm the, the technical director from the Dongfang Offshore. Uh, Dongfang Offshore is uh, the largest uh, marine uh, contractor in Taiwan. We already involved the, the second phase offshore winds uh, in Taiwan, and uh, we are preparing for the third phase uh, offshore wind industries. And uh, we hope uh, we uh, have uh, the good opportunity to, to go into on. And uh, I'm very pleased to uh, uh, attending this uh, uh, seminar in here, it's uh, very nice and uh, good to see you. Thank you. My, Thank name, you. Oh, sorry. My name is Claire Lohan. I'm the CEO of CIP's Round 3 projects here in Taiwan. Um, at CIP, we're developing more than six gigawatts of offshore wind farms um, in preparation for the Round 3 auctions that will start this year. Um, 3.3 gigawatts of those projects are potentially uh, floating wind farms. So I'm very happy to uh, be here today to discuss the challenges. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wei Tei Chen. I'm from Mental Industry Research and Development uh, Centers, which is the government funded organizations. Uh, I'm also uh, the deputy directors of Marine Time uh, Technology Innovation and uh, promotion, sent, uh, promotion department. Uh, I, I think everyone knows uh, offshore wind power is one of the biggest uh, green energy development policy that uh, the current government's uh, uh, input so M M4. And so uh, the reason why we have formed this new department, uh, mainly just uh, for uh, develop the technology which the all the industry needed and also try to do whatever help we can to help this industry prom, uh, uh, grow and to match uh, the uh, to meet the government's goal so today is very glad and my pleasure to be here to join this uh, section thank you hello my name is Raoul Kubicek I'm the managing director of Niras Taiwan which is a Danish multidisciplinary engineering company with a long track record in offshore wind um, in Taiwan, we're very active since 2012 uh, on both sides, environment and engineering. And floating wind is something we are deeply involved in in Europe, but actually also in Taiwan and in other regions. So it's a very interesting panel today, and we're looking forward to the discussion. Um, I'm Mike Zhou. I'm the vice president and spokesperson of CSBC. And CSBC is a large ship, uh, shipyard in Taiwan. Our main business sector, including the international commercial ships, and government project and also the Navy program. And the last one was the newly uh, green energy from the offshore wind. And the third phase, the uh, floating type will be uh, main topics and hot topics. So CSBC, we will not be absent from this field. So I'm very happy to join this session part two. Thank you. Well, perhaps I could come to you first um, and we can just set the context a little bit. Um, you know, where is floating offshore wind technology now and, and what's the key focus? that's been sort of all over the world that people are thinking about? It's a good question, Richard, and I think it, it nicely sets the scene for, for this panel. Um, floating wind is not per se something very new. It has a long history in oil and gas, actually, and oil and gas people might even look a little bit at offshore wind people and say, like, hey, that's easy. Why are you kind of discussing that? Um, 
It's back in, in, in Europe, we have already seen, you know, like uh, model or pre-commercialization, um, for example, in Norway, in Scotland, in Portugal, in France. So there's a lot going on. Also our neighbors here in Japan, in Fukushima, we had different tests with different types. Um, and we see at least from, from Europe that there is now a strong effort like in Scotland on Scotwind, but also England with the leases and then um, Portugal and Spain looking into offshore wind floating up to 2030 actually in the gigawatts. So there is kind of a firmer understanding of different technologies that can be used, semi-submersible, um, tension leg platforms um, or spa boys, depending on the situation. So it, it, it's quite interesting because we're kind of moving out of that research more into commercialization and, and a strong interest also from Taiwan, which started one or two years ago. Well, actually, Taiwan has a little bit of longer history with floating, but it's kind of taking this now really like in the centerpiece of their development. Yeah, thank you. Um, Wait, uh, do you mind if I ask you, um, you know, when we talk about technologies in the context of floating offshore winds, uh, perhaps you could tell us about what, what, are we, what are we thinking? What, what's different to what we know of offshore wind in terms of fixed bottom? Well, um, I think floating, of course, is a different type of offshore wind powers. Uh, you know, uh, currently in Taiwan, uh, all the experience and experts are focusing on the uh, fixing type. But for open, actually, he, it has a diff, totally different uh, a mechanism for stabilization to uh, make the wind turbine can perform as expected or as designed. So this is new, and although uh, again, it's, it's, it's two two town is new, and although there are quite a few good experience in Europe, but again, it's all also very limited to certain area and and. and those technology and experience also hold by such small group of company. So I think uh, floating wind uh, floating uh, wind turbine actually uh, from many many analysis or report it is one of the trend in the future, particularly good for the deep water. Mm. And uh, in Taiwan, I think more than sixty percent of the excellent wind farm is located with the dips more than fifty meters depth. So I think this is good, and today uh, we can have uh, some discussion and, and talk regarding how Taiwan can develop the floating wind type, uh, wind energy. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we'll go on to discuss the different technologies in a moment, but just before we do that, um, Claire, I'd just like to come to you. I mean, because obviously context is important, um, and no country is identical. Um, thinking about sort of Taiwan-specific factors, what, what kind of things do you take into account when you're deciding what's the best technology for a particular market or what you'd like to deploy? Sure. Uh, well, you're absolutely right. Uh, no two places are the same. Uh, at CIP, we say that we are technology agnostic. Uh, and what that really means is that we're not necessarily married to one concept that we want to roll out in all the regions that we work in. Um, a couple of years ago, we set up a floating offshore wind competence center in Edinburgh. Um, speaking to some of the engineers there, they tell me that there's actually more than 100 concepts out there in varying stages of maturity and development. Um, so, you know, we'll work hard to try and understand exactly which w is suitable for Taiwan. But if I was to pick out some uh, specific criteria that we would look at, I would say um, the technology maturity is obviously very important. Um, localization potential, I think particularly in Taiwan, is, a, is an important topic. Uh, cost out potential. Um, there are specific permitting, regulatory, consenting type issues that must be taken account of. Um, and then, of course, just the, the site itself. Um, there is always uh, uh, specifics about the site that, that might lead you to pick one uh, technology or another. OK, that's, that's really helpful. I mean, so the. I mean, then we think about the actual technologies, the one that stands out, we've already sort of had a couple of mentions to it, is obviously the foundations themselves <laughs> are the key distinction. Um, and so, Mike, I'd like to come to you. Um, you know, I understand that you've, you've already been looking yeah. uh, at different technologies and different foundations. Um, you know, what factors are you taking into account when you decide you know, what, what's the most appropriate design mm -hmm. um, and, and what considerations have you okay. already been thinking about? Okay, actually, the localization is the most important one. And last year, the, uh, the National Taiwan University and the CSBC, we formed a local team and got the support funding from the Ministry of Science and Technology. And the main objective of this research is 
focus on the dynamic control of the floater and also the motion response and the mooring system analysis and finally the scale down uh, uh, model test to verify the uh, performance of the floater itself. And before we do that, we, we make a market survey and set a target. And the first step is that we try to approach the, the we try to approach the oil and gas uh, technology, which have been funded for more than 50 years. And the same concept was that the offshore wind farm, we get the air, we get the wind power from the air above the sea. And the oil and gas, we pump out the, the material below the sea and from the seabed. And this kind of technology actually is quite mature. And before that, we have to think about the performance, performance of the floater. And this chart shows that uh, we have to achieve the performance of the stability of the floater in case they can provide a steady and smooth uh, power generation. And from this chart, you can see we're using different kind of a column diameter and comparing with the uh, uh, limitation of the pitch angle I think maybe less than 10 degrees, and providing the scale of the size. And we make a optimization with less motion, less material weight, and also the uh, proper uh, ballast uh, weight to keep the station of the, the floater. And also, it's local and it's practical. And I think the result of our fighting will be a wise choice in Taiwan uh, offshore wind. Yep. Um, and, and Glenn, so turning to you next. I mean, we're aware that there's uh, many different types of technologies, sort of, you know, the semi-submersibles, spar, tension legs. Do, do you have you been thinking about the different options, and do you have a view whether sort of some be more appropriate for Taiwan than others? Yeah. Um, thanks, Richard, for this question. I think it's uh, still a bit too early to really finalize the uh, the final design. But again, uh, like uh, Claire Raum just mentioned that uh, we, we have to really consider water depth, we have to consider localization. Also, we need to consider the uh, dimension of the shipyard currently available in Taiwan. So all in all, it, it has to be considered um, seriously. And if, if this has to be a short answer now, I, I probably will go with uh, semi-submersible and uh, maybe the damping pool system because uh, first of all, I think the current available sea area in Taiwan within current regulation, we're looking at the, the water depth is mostly around uh, 50 meters to maybe 200 meters. So in, in this kind of a water depth, I think for semi-submersible uh, damping pool system um, will probably is suitable and, and also will be fitting a current shipyard dimension in Taiwan. Yeah, thanks. Um, Claire, I guess sort of coming to you with a similar question, really. You know, in terms of you've obviously been doing a, quite a lot of work on mm -hmm. uh, your sort of preparing for your projects. Do you have any thoughts about the, the sort of type of technology in terms of foundations that might be most suited? Yes. Um, so uh, we haven't made a final selection yet. I think I mentioned we're yeah. uh, investi investigating quite a lot of different options. I think one that seems um, quite promising for Taiwan is the Tetra concept. Um, the reason that I think it uh, could be particularly relevant in Taiwan is because uh, it has a modular design approach. Uh, that means that uh, there is good potential for cost reduction. Um, there are good localization opportunities related to this concept also, which um, as I think we've discussed um, already, there's really something very important in Taiwan. Uh, so we say that, see that as something uh, with good potential here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's interesting that everyone's already picking up on the, the localization point, so hopefully yes. we'll come to that in a bit more detail. Um, I mean, the other thing that I note from when you're speaking is that you know, everyone's saying it's, you know, a few of the panel have already mentioned that you know, there's a large number of designs available at the moment, and everyone seems reluctant to commit too early. Perhaps you could just talk about, you know, is, is there a risk of committing too early? Do we need to keep open the design, you know, look at options such as concrete, as well as perhaps steel that people are already exploring? I think it's, uh, 
The, the quite interesting thing is that floating wind in Taiwan is so early that we're actually currently discussing how to come up with, you know, like a regulatory pathway to it. Mm -hmm. So, and it's really good to see that there's so much considerations on different types and what could work. But ultimately, there's a lot of factors, and one is, for example, the geological conditions on the sea or in the sea. Then you have the harbors, you know, what is the availability? Which kind of technology could perhaps Taiwanese companies drive, or which could be interesting for overseas companies to say Taiwan is an extremely interesting place to do that? And then which kind of technology do they bring to the table? And I think one of the steps for this year should be perhaps to be a little bit more agnostic and just go through, and the Ministry of Science Technology has this wonderful project, for example, to say, okay, these are for our area very interesting ones, and, and we keep it a little bit open because we might have still a competition among technologies before we say, okay, this is this, and now we do it. Because there might be even some areas at some point where spa boys might, might be interesting. Not now, but they might come. So. Yeah, thank you. James, um, oh. just turning to you now, because I mean, obviously the, the installation um, is going to be quite different. You know, we, we hear sort of concepts about assembly on shore and then towing. Uh, what, what impact is that likely to have on, in terms of technology for vessel operators? Are you, are you going to have to rethink um, sort of how you operate um, and the technologies that you deploy? Yep. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard. So I think so we can from the three aspects that you're talking about this once, uh, because the windows, uh, the, the floating, so it's uh, totally different from the, the heat uh, installation, it's uh, totally different from the fixed buttons. So we can understand, so it really have to, we, we, uh, in the fixed button, we use in the uh, piling vessel to, to do in the pile and to, to install the, the turbines and then to do uh, the operations and then, but the, the floatings is a difference. We have to, to install the, the turbine on the, the floater and then we have to, to tow out to the, to the sites and then installations. So it's a uh, totally different. So it's a, the, the technology is a, the another challenge. Uh, another one, so because uh, the, the, the process is a different, so we have to uh, adapt different uh, fleet. Yep, uh, the different fleet is re requirements. So in right here, so we have to think about uh, the uh, different, um, like maybe we have to import uh, the, some the, like, uh, or the larger the top, top board to tow in the, the, the floating the winds uh, to the sides. And uh, in other ways, uh, uh, we have to think about how to install the mooring lines and uh, the chains and the anchors and uh, the like, dynamic cables. Uh, it's a diff different process. So from the, this uh, challenge uh, in Taiwan, so actually we do not have the, uh, a lot of the experience on this technology. So maybe uh, in the future we have to, to outsource things. So we need to the, 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 the take some technology and the, from the overseas uh, into, into the Taiwan, and then we can achieve the, the goal. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that leads us quite nicely on to thinking about, you know, the foundation is obviously a very important part, but it, it is only one part. You know, there's a couple of other things that are quite different about floating. Uh, you know, the mooring lines, the dynamic cables, the, the anchors. Um, Glenn, perhaps I could just come to you. I mean, do, do you have any views again on what solutions are, are most suited for Taiwan or, or, you know, what you think are the key considerations around sort of some of these more peripheral parts? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Again, I think it's a quite difficult question at this stage. Um, there are several major components other than foundation that we need to look into. Uh, firstly, it is the, uh, the mooring system. And in terms of the mooring system, uh, the first factor comes, to, comes into looking is the water depth again. So given that the current available sea area um, announced that I, I think the, uh, the catenary mooring system probably will be more feasible compared to the tension leg uh, mooring system. And another one to look into is the, the anchor. And we know that based on the oil gas industry experience, uh, there are several types of anchor has been available in, in, in the market already. But in our current study, I think we probably, probably will be uh, going to the uh, drag anchor because there, there are some um, discussion around other types of anchor, or for example, the torpedo ones. It actually needs a, a, a deeper water depth 
to gain enough free fall speed to penet penetrate embedded into the seabed. So again, comes into water depth, comes into localization, uh, just uh, too many factors has to, be, has to be considered at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's a really good point. Um, and let me just to sort of finish off this section in terms of thinking about the specific technologies uh, role, I'd like to sort of turn to you because um, you know, obviously things such as mooring lines and dynamic cables, um, you know, they're new for in Taiwan context. Do you think they might raise any sort of new environmental issues or technical issues that we need to think about a little bit differently? I think there's, uh, interestingly enough, environmental issues perhaps, it's, it's going to be a little bit different to fix bottom. Um, and there have been other projects worldwide which can be used. It's going to be interesting because the moment you have these centenary lines, the question is how, you know, how will it impact the marine species down there. Mm. Um, on the other hand side, floating wind is often accepted because you push it out very far. So people usually don't see it, so they don't expect you know, this to be a burden on them. And it also might be interesting for the regeneration of fish, fishing schools and so on. So there might be some upsides to this, but then there might be considerations also for the government on, on fisheries, um, on, on some more research where I think if you if you start with, you know, there are already EIAs actually started on that, but and, and they think about mitigation, and there's always the opportunity to mitigate, is if you really start into model zones, and then you collect data, you make this data available to everyone, it becomes a very interesting testing field. Also for other projects, actually in Japan or Korea, if they, if Taiwan is fast enough, probably ahead of this. So they, there's, there's a lot to share, but there's also a lot to consider, and then just coming to the centenary lines, they can be like four to 10 times of the water there, so they can have actually quite one footprint that needs to be considered. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to move on to thinking about the infrastructure that we need for, for floating. Um, and I'd like to explore a little about how this differs um, to what we sort of see for, for fixed bottom. Um, and, and James, perhaps I could come to you, perhaps you could sort of give us your thoughts on how do you see the port's infrastructure needs being different um, for, for floating? Yep. Uh, I think so the, the, the floating, the basically they are doing in the, the shipyard. Yeah, I, I, from, I know the, is it the learned from the Scotland uh, projects. So maybe the shipyard is the, the, the first solution to the floating uh, winds. Uh, but uh, in Taiwan, we know so there's only the CSP, just only the CSPC, they have the, enough the, the big uh, shipyard to to build this uh, to build it, uh, this uh, uh, floating uh, wind uh, and the floater and to install the the uh, turbines and uh, I think so there is another spec aspect that we can think about is uh, currently so we have already so have uh, some uh, heavy uh, bearing capacity uh, uh, wharf in Taiwan so for example we have the uh, some of the in Taichung harbors, maybe we can uh, take uh, some innovation technology and uh, to revise and uh, uh, modify it, and then uh, we can use the the, the big and uh, the heavy cranes mm -hmm. and to, to uh, manufacture the the floater and then to using the the big cranes to hand out the, this uh, the floating to the the sea. The but. We had to think about the, if the, the, the water basin is enough depth or not. Mm. Uh, in other ways, uh, maybe we can uh, apply to another the sink. Uh, maybe we can use uh, the, the ship uh, slip. Yep, uh, it's a uh, different. But uh, right now, so the, the space is not enough. So, so maybe we have to think about uh, from the government uh, the, the thinking. Uh, and uh, maybe we have to do the, some uh, master plan. Mm. Uh, in the future, so, and then uh, we can uh, co co collect a lot of the, the uh, data and the information from the overseas, and, and then we can to do in it and to build uh, the more suitable uh, infrastructures uh, in Taiwan to meet the, the requirements of the mm. floating wind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, and that's really interesting, sort of, uh, I guess the master plan for ports is, is what you're thinking, is that right? Yeah. I mean, is that something you think would be advisable to do sort of soon, or is, is there time to wait? Is it something that needs yep. to be progressed? Uh, because I know uh, the, 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 the master plans uh, in Taiwan for the, the ports, it's uh, basically they're doing this uh, the five years uh, time, so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, five years uh, once. 
Okay, so maybe the, this year the lower already said the doing the, the, some master plans, uh, but uh, after five years uh, they can uh, roll it out and uh, continue to move, move in and uh, then to modify it. So in this moment, uh, I think uh, is the quite it, and the very urgent uh, the times. Uh, we do not have uh, the, enough the times. Because uh, you want to build the infrastructure, we, you need the three or four years. Otherwise, uh, we will miss the, the, the time. Yeah. yeah. So the, this moment uh, is the, the, the best time to, to do the, the master plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mike, perhaps yeah. I could just turn to you now and thinking about sort of port infrastructure. Um, you know, as, as you're thinking about, you know, I guess industrializing mm -hmm. uh, your future designs, particularly you know, for the uh, the foundations. Um, do you, have you been thinking about the port needs mm -hmm. um, and, and your ports and how you might utilize those in the future? Mm -hmm. I think for this part, I will try to divide it for two parts. The first part will be how the shipyard or like a century uh, they can build from the existing facility. And because from the tidal flow, you can see that uh, there are three vertical columns, they are all flat, and also the supporting base is flat. And also the connecting passage for the top race is also flat. So it's very easy for those structures to be decomposed to a flat panel and can be produced in the production line with the roller system. And, and due to the production line operation, uh, automatic and semi-automatic uh, machine can be applied. And that means the speed and also provide the quality. So I think it's a very key issue for, for this kind of uh, consideration. And, and then those uh, small blocks then can shift to the following work like painting, grand assembly, uh, very near the uh, dry dock side or the key side to do the makeup block. And finally, for luncheon. And for CSBC, we have a dry dock, so we can easily for luncheon. But for the century, uh, they maybe need to apply or invest on a floating dock. So they can use SPMT to transport the, the, the floater to the float, floating dock, then launching to the key side. And the other one key issue is after launching, because the light, light weight of the floater itself, maybe the drop is about three or four uh, meters. So most of the harbor, uh, the draft can, can, can handle. However, if we want to install the mast and also the turbine and the blade. The draft may be reached 10 meters and some port probably cannot handle this kind of installation on port uh, and then towing to, to the offshore wind. So that, that issue also have to consider. The other one is because when the fixed type uh, offshore, a lot of component already storage in this port area and how can it provide additional space, especially for the key, for the installation? That is one issue we have to consider during the floating uh, type uh, 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 implementation, maybe for round three or maybe after round three. And for the floater, floater type, I think there's a one thing I have to stress that is a cost effectiveness because the process is quite similar to building a, sh a ship like in the parallel body. And it's very easy to control the, the tempo of the production and also the, the quality. And that means existing facility. And most of the local supplier, they don't have to make a lot of investment. That means we can provide a good quality and good performance but relatively lower uh, budget. So it's also very attractive for the developer uh, from this, this point of view. And, and I think that will be a quite a successful key point. But however, we have to solve the port facility issue and so to get the cost, effective, uh, cost effectiveness for the floaters. That's really, really interesting points. I mean, I might just open this up slightly. I don't know. If, does anybody else have a view in terms of you know what what do we what should we really be prioritising now to uh, sort of get the infrastructure sort of up to standard um, to progress this? Um, I was wondering, Glenn, do you have any views on 
Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. From a local developer's uh, perspective, um, I think I, I try to cut in into uh, government's perspective because I, th I think the current auction system kind of be a mix of bottom fixed project and, and floating project. It doesn't really differentiate in terms of the price, the subsidy, or the localization plan. But I think a clean target to differentiate the floating target uh, within a current timeline milestone will certainly drive the full industry, the supply chain to adapt to the new scheme ra rather than just mixing uh, both uh, program around. Mm -hmm. So this, this is my idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Yeah. So that, yeah, just I think that's a fair point because also in other markets we see that floating is not treated as fixed. Mm. So, and then Taiwan is kind of the conundrum and very fast moving out third round auction and then kind of oh there's floating. One issue that Taiwan has is we have 15 gigawatts from 26 to 2035 and if you look at the map, there's probably just not even 10 gigawatt of fixed bottom. And then you have to go into floating. So it's actually if the net zero 2050 plan speaks about floating in 2030, it's probably too late. So it needs to be moved forward so that it probably comes 28, 29. But then we just have that conflation of how do I make sure that it's investor security for the developers? How do I make sure it's investor security for the, let's say, the suppliers so that, you know, they invest into the machineries? How do I pull in the, the harbor infrastructure um, so that the harbor comes out early and says, hey, that's super interesting to invest. Let's do it now so we're ready in, in four or five years. And I don't know, there's perhaps also more than just Taichung Harbor and I forgot the damping pool because the damping pool is actually quite interesting because it's a concrete system. Mm -hmm. And what Taiwan also has is a concrete industry. Mm -hmm. And it's probably easier than importing, I'm really sorry, importing steel. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it could be also an interesting option and then probably you mix around some of the harvest, right? It's, it, it's gonna be interesting because also Taiwan is, n is, is kind of in the second round also is the shipyards in Taiwan are actually quite busy. So the question is, will the shipyards have enough capability to do that? Um, and as we see, they do their homework, they're very interested. So, but I think this all needs to be slowly answered so that in 28, 29, we might see the first ones, you know, going somewhere. And I guess just to put it in a global context as well, 28, 29 is, is relatively early yeah. um, by any market, which means we probably need to be, particularly the infrastructure, which probably has the longest lead time, mm. we mm -hmm. probably need to be thinking about mm. now, yeah. really. Yeah. 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 Um, Wade, perhaps I could come to you. Um, um, I'd like to explore now perhaps the, the opportunities for Taiwan and mm. Taiwan industry um, from sort of some of the technologies that we've discussed. Um, you know, we've covered quite a few. Do, do you have a sense of that some of these technologies might be particularly suited to Taiwan or where there's a, a you know, particular opportunity? Okay, yeah, I think, uh, well, uh, floating, I think uh, just now all experts present today has raise uh, uh, different aspect of floating wing powers from the uh, floater, from the mooring, from the anchor, even uh, the infrastructure's need and transportation. But I believe, uh, you know, uh, developing a successful floating wing farm is very complicated, especially this technology is new and it's very limited only to a few companies or a few couple countries only. So in Taiwan, how industry can jump in and developing this floating is also one of the assignments we are considering, we are doing, we have a whole team is you know, doing this kind of work every day. So of course, um, floating, floater is one of the major things and like uh, uh, Mr. Joe, Mike just mentioned, you know, there's quite a few, uh, probably one or two Taiwan group already developed the, 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 the particular type. And it sounds, it sounds very similar, uh, very good for Taiwan uh, area. So uh, from our point of view, uh, also getting the experience from the fixing type wing farm development. I think as, 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 as just mentioned, you know, the time is always limited and, and pushing. And, but uh, according to the amount of capacity that the Taiwanese government has ambitions to achieve in the next ten, uh, 10 years, there are many, many more farms will be built and, and, and up running in the next 10 years. So 
from from our experience, we were also considering in order real in order to realize this concept, those technology. Uh, not only just the technology, also need to consider the standards, the talents. I think that's all the good opportunity, good area the Taiwanese industry needed. And the good thing, uh, according to the previous experience, I think the good thing is um, there are all the most of the leading companies or countries in this area all coming to Taiwan in the last three, four, five years. So more or less, most of the company more or less have the experience working with Taiwanese company. So there's a good base and how we can uh, tune or find out an even more uh, aggressive method to help industry to integrate with all these companies, to adopt new technology, to uh, install the standards in, in, the, in, in, in the industry, you know, and to make all the industry understand this is the must be standards. It's not negotiable. One thing very important uh, is that, as, uh, like a couple of days ago, we just have a, meet, telephone, uh, a, a co meeting with the IMCA in England. And one thing is mentioned safety is always one of the most important issues besides the technology. But maybe most of the developer or a uh, uh, company from overseas, they will find. HSE system seems to be in Taiwan not so solid, or there are always the gap. Oh, not say it's no good in Taiwan, but there are also a gap between different countries. So how can the interest also enhance? We treat it as a technology development too, to make the people in the future working safely on in the sea, offshore, offshorely. It's also is one of our tasks. So, uh, well, this is what I think. Besides the technology, all the talents, standards, safety is all part of the technology should coming all together. No, I, I, that's a fantastic answer, and, and I think it's sort of, you know, I guess, a following question that I, I would add to that. You know, you mentioned about a lot of the the world sort of coming to Taiwan, mm. um, particularly European industry. Yeah. But I guess when they arrived, the fixed bottom is already quite mature in, mm. in Europe. The difference with floating mm. is that actually. It's, it's, it's still being refined mm. globally. Do you, do you think that opens up an opportunity for Taiwan, perhaps different to the fixed bottom mm. phase of uh, the industry here? Definitely. Not only just the floater. You know, floater is one thing. Mooring is another thing. Anchor is also another, another piece of the good area, good area that uh, can both, you know, maybe different companies join together to develop particular type good for Taiwan. And even, the, I think, uh, transportation is another story as well. You know, besides, besides the, I would say, except the harbor infrastructure side, all the others, from the top to the bottom, all the good opportunity for Taiwan. I think, uh, as being in research area for many years, I always have a very uh, positive look if there, even there is a problem, might be not so suitable. You know, you get some idea, some design from Europe, and it might not be suitable, or may not be so idea for Taiwan area. It's good for me because that is the area the Taiwan industry can develop, especially in ASEAN region. And if we can really follow the schedule as all all all, all the, the colleague today uh, mentioned, we are probably the leading country in ASEAN region. So as long as we can uh, gain the full set of experience, even I treat it as a technology. A lot of people are, are looking for this kind of full set of the technology right from the survey right from, and, 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 and design, construction, op, uh, operation and maintenance. And the full system is, is, is all opportunities there. You know? And so that is what I thought maybe in the future. As even one topic we are discussing within the team, how can we how can we develop the AI technology into these sectors? For example, one thing is the digital twin. How can we well use the digital twin technology to simulate all the aspects of the construction or engineering issues to make sure everything have, will be done under our design, under 
the condition allowed. So that's also one thing I believe is important. Will also help the industry or, or whatever developer they would like to join in this uh, development, flo uh, floating wing uh, power development, will, will provide a big help. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe I'd like to come to get a developer perspective at this yeah. point. Um, yeah, both of you mentioned that the local supply chain capabilities was, was an important point. Um, and I'm conscious you're both thinking about floating now. Um, what, what's your perspective? Perhaps I come to Claire first. What's, what's your perspective on uh, the readiness of Taiwan supply chain and, and any observations you've made during when you've been thinking about this? Sure. Um, so we are involved in floating offshore wind farm development projects um, all over the world. Mm -hmm. So I think our most mature project is the Pentland project in uh, Scotland, uh, but there's several others in Europe and also in the US. Mm -hmm. So we're speaking to the supply chain all over the world, mm -hmm. as well as in Taiwan, because we have these 3.3 gigawatts yes. here. Uh, one example of something that uh, we think could be a very specific opportunity for Taiwan is that um, there is a global bottleneck in um, tubular, large tubular sections, so extremely large kind of nine plus meter um, sections. So there's a global issue with the, with the supply of those uh, types of sections. Um, speaking to the supply chain within Taiwan, there's actually already some existing capacity for that kind of thing, mm. um, and also some investment going into, um, you know, increasing that capacity in the future. Right. So to take a specific example, um, I think, you know, that's something amongst many other opportunities for Taiwan to uh, not just supply to the Round 3 projects and beyond, but actually export. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Glenn, yeah. perhaps I could turn to you with the, the same question. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think it's a really good question as Taya, as a local developer, we are very uh, supply chain oriented, which means that we, we like to, uh, you know, creating jobs, pushing policy and uh, support the supply chain. And one, again, one, one I think inter interesting example would be the, the foundation. Take, take the damping pool system, for example, um, just like Raul mentioned in Taiwan, actually we have some quite good, robust cement related industry construction company in Taiwan already but it, they're just lacking of opportunity to really step into the, the foundation mm. category. So I think maybe, maybe this is just uh, one angle for the you know, cement industry. Actually, we, we've spoken to um, numerous cement-related uh, construction company in Taiwan. They're all very interested and ready to look into the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks. So, I mean, from the three of you, it sounds like there's, there's certainly opportunities here uh, for Taiwan supply chain. Raul, perhaps I could turn to you now. I mean, do you have any thoughts on the incentives that might support industry to really take that step and to make the investments um, that would be necessary for floating? That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Especially, we, first we entangle, we need to entangle floating wind from the current scheme of the third round. Do not forget the third round is unsubsidized. I think that's even sometimes lost on some people in, in Taiwan, even in the ministry, is this whatever, you know, the, the developers will build now on fixed bottom. Taipo will pay a little bit of money and then um, there will be CPPAs, but there's no money flowing anymore, arguably from any side, from the government to do that. I think in floating wind you will have a challenge of, of building the infrastructure and you need to have these kind of investor securities. And perhaps taking you back in 2016, the government had a really good vision for offshore wind. And they back out pushed then and said, yeah, we, want, we have this target actually back then of 3.5 gigawatt. These are the zones, welcome world, get your EIA, then there's a feed-in tariff. And the world came. And they employ now hundreds of people, which back then, me and 10, I mean, we knew everyone. It's just like a little village back then, but now it's like a lot of people. We need this kind of spirit to come into floating wind again and to say, how do we create a floating wind incentive, which could be driven from the developer side to say, okay, we give you really security. If you take the side, you know, you don't go to auction, you directly go into something, which could be a feed-in tariff or could, could be some kind of form of, of, of subsidies. Or it could be on the supply side to say, developer, please sit down with local suppliers, with foreign suppliers, because I also, climate change is international, so it shouldn't be an exercise of nationalism. It should be an exercise of, of bringing all of that together. But then perhaps different developer, let's say there's already 10 actually doing floating wind projects, so they write, then there might be three areas, and then they write a proposal 
with certain companies in it who then get shortlisted by the government. The government allows for subsidies for the suppliers or matching funds so that they know when we invest now, let's say we have 200 megawatts and then there might be a gigawatt field. And there's 10 developers, so I think like three sites might be very interesting to start with. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a really interesting suggestion mm -hmm. and uh, kind of leads us on to, uh, I guess we would be interested to get, get others' views on, on, you know, whether there are any lessons from those, the first rounds that we've seen, mm. um, you know, particularly, you know, the localization policy um, that's, that was applied, you know, do we want to see the same again uh, for floating or do you think there are refinements that perhaps would be advantageous when we think about um, floating? I mean, perhaps I could come to the MIRDC view. Right. Uh, I, I think localization, uh, uh, along with the uh, offshore wind power development, is always one of the government uh, care. They really uh, hope you know the Taiwan industry can also grow and develop to match with this development. And not only I, I believe uh, for on the next round, uh, not only just the government policy might still apply, but uh, I think the market demand is also getting stronger. You see, one side, uh, previously the Taiwanese industry did, doesn't have much experience previously, even almost zero. But after three, four, five years, I believe uh, if we are talking about floating and talking about localization, those companies that we contact uh, all now have been involved in this area or getting, the, I think their technology, their facility, their manufacturing uh, uh, standard and so on were getting upgraded. We're much closer to our uh, public developer or, 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 or customers uh, demand. So uh, there's two, I think there will be two push way, two push force or to or, or, or follow localization, you know, um, but uh, personally, I would say, as a government funded organization, uh, I would say honestly, uh, there is a few strategy or method or condition uh, from the government localization policy can be tuned, make it more reasonable, more open, more realistic. You know, but helping Taiwanese industry to grow, to become more mature, become more competitive in the national international market, I believe that is the right policy. Just the way to do it maybe uh, can be altered or can be tuned it in a better way. That, that mm. makes sense. Uh, Claire, do, do you have any thoughts? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I agree. Yeah. Um, I think we've all learned a lot from round two. Yeah. Developers, suppliers, government, everybody. Yes. Um, and we should apply those lear learnings to round three and beyond. Mm. Um, I think one specific area uh, to bring out it could be uh, the foundation uh, fabrication um, assembly. Uh, this is not something that can be done overnight. Um, it needs time and space to build up the capacity. Um, I think that's a common view from everybody. Um, and actually, perhaps the best way to do that is via a demonstration plant that I think Raul um, yeah. touched on earlier mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. uh, because you get to uh, demonstrate the supply chain and give the supply chain a chance to, um, to, to know what's required. Yeah. Um, but also some of the other topics that we touched on earlier, like the regulatory um, regime, consenting, permitting, mm -hmm. and other things can also be really heavily supported by a, a good quality kind of demo. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, that, that perhaps I'll go on to that question next. Uh, mm. you know, but so what, what should happen next? Is, is a demonstration mm. the right approach? Is that what we want to see first? Mm. Um, and I guess, you know, what, what would the timing of that, what the, should the timing of that be? And, and how do we ensure that the lessons are really learned if we mm. are going to progress a demonstration project? Um, I, I, again, whether, perhaps I come to you again, sort of, because, you know, you're, well, you're looking yes, at this. Well, uh, have idea of, uh, Establish a, a, a demonstration farm for the floating is one of the ideas and subjects we have been doing since last year. And we also proposed to the government a couple of times. And I believe, uh, I think the government listen and they know it is necessary, especially in the floating wing farm development. It's, it's important. And this is the three, uh, from my point of view, we cut it into three parties governments, 
developer and industry. And I will keep thinking, what is the purpose we need, we want to get from the demonstration site? And which can make three-party win-win-win situation. And okay, uh, so one thing, the government need to get all the information about the experience, how to develop right from the bottom to the top, right from the day one to maybe year five. That is uh, as invaluable, important information the government required and they wanted. Also, uh, for the industry, simple. By using this kind of opportunity, they can evaluate, as what Kalash just said, you know, what do they need to do to reach the standard, to make their product can be sold, can be sold easily, can be competitive in the market, can be up to the standard everybody appreciate. This one and the third, third party, of course, the developer. They can using this kind of opportunity to gain all the experience they need to decide decided which kind of floating they want and how their uh, resources can be put in. What is the 10 time frame? They will get their return as expected. And so this all importance and this I, as also we are working on it. Hopefully there will be the good news in the near future. <laughs> First I could come to you Mike because I know you've been thinking about a demonstration project. Yes. What, what do you see the value of? of I, I think for the demo, demo side, the main purpose is to avoid the risk and also save the, the cost and the, to, to avoid any further uh, difficulty that maybe both parties may, may counter. And for, for, for the tidal flow, actually, by sake of the IT uh, technology and also the supercomputer, a lot of a lot of the numerical analysis have been performed, and optimization still continue to to improve the the, the performance of the floater, and also the scale down the model test should be should be done to verify the result. And actually, our team have uh, attended a conference in Europe for the ocean, uh, offshore, and Arctic uh, engineering for the oil and gas uh, conference. And there's a session for the floater for offshore. And the first one is a PPI, and the second one is a tidal float. A lot of questions was, was raised and during that session. And they, they can agree that our, our technology, however, what, what is the, the records? So actually, they still want to make the records. And demo, demonstration uh, is a really important. Actually, we already contact with the National Taiwan Ocean University. They, we are going to have a demo site for the smaller uh, floating type of uh, uh, turbine. And I think that will be make some promise for the developer can go ahead and to stick with the local uh, design and engineering. Just before we wrap up, I've just got one question that I'd like to possibly sort of put to Glenn and Claire, which is, you know, I'm conscious that you're developing commercial scale projects. You know, you're thinking about that and, you know, we may even see bids into the round three auctions with floating projects. What's your view about the time scales that we, you know, if we are going to do a demonstration project, how urgent is that? Is there time for that? Or do we need to think about commercial or pre-commercial? Um, I don't, don't know who wants to go first. Uh, okay. Glenn, do you want to go? Yeah. Well, I think um, the time, timeline wise is quite tight now, given that already commercial project probably will come into 27 and 28. Um, and then the port will be fully occupied before that and for, for bottom fixed project. So I think a, a reasonable timing for a demo project probably will be sitting in 2025. I think that's the reasonable time stop. But again, um, we, we all know the purpose is to find the right coordination. But timing wise, I know it's really challenging. For the installation of for, for the project. Yeah, for the installation and maybe COD in, yeah. 2028 20, yeah. yeah. or 2029. Yeah. And Claire, yeah. is there anything, any point you want to add to that? No, I, I agree with that. Um, mm. I think also that one demonstration project is probably not enough. I think uh, two or more, um, up to maybe 200 megawatts, That's. Uh, I think yeah. that could be really valuable. Which is very much where it's heading in. Yes. In the agreement. Yeah. I think yeah. 200 megawatt is the minimum. Yes. Well, well, thank you, everybody. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, sort of talk to us today. It's an incredibly interesting discussion, um, and I think we need to, to end it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.